Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Robert Doerr, the president of AEI, and I'm very glad that you could join us for this discussion with my old friend Jason DeParle about his important new book, A Good Provider is One Who Leads. Uh, now, I have to uh, say that this is a certain personal connection for me because a long time ago, and this is a good message for young people at AEI, I came to Washington and I was in charge of taking out the garbage at the Washington Monthly um, and other jobs of that nature. And you may not know this, but the Washington Monthly has a great tradition of wonderful reporters. Jim Fallows, Nick Lemon, Mickey Kaus, uh, Matt Cooper, Paul Glaster, Steve Waldman, they were all there and around there and I got to watch them work. And then one day someone said, you know, the, the best young reporter in America works at the New Orleans Times Picune and his name is Jason DeParle and you should hire him. Now it wasn't me doing the hiring, but it was all of them along with Charlie Peters and um, we hired Jason, or they hired Jason, and we brought him to Washington. And there was only one job for me. And my job was to put him up and have him stay at my house, or our apartment. And we lived in a basement apartment, damp place, Jason, you might have forgotten this, you might have blacked this out, uh, in a damp, uh, it was a nice neighborhood, but it was a really uh, kind of unpleasant apartment. And my memory is, is that I gave Jason the bed, and I slept on the floor. And that's how much I admired him then, and I still admire him now. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of a, a, a reunion for me to have Jason back here. But I have to say, he's had an extraordinary career, which I've followed uh, since then. He's been reporting for The Times for just about 30 years, writing about social policy, poverty, and migration. His work has taken him all around the world, from Milwaukee to Manila, detailing the struggles and efforts of parents to work for a, a more prosperous future for their children and future generations. His heart is in his writing, and the greatness of his writing is its reporting. Jason reports great details that tell the story. In addition to um, um, being a good writer, he, his, his career, his expertise, his skill is built on the fact that he's a great reporter. Um, his first book, American Dream, Three Women, Ten Kids, and a Nation's Drive to End Welfare, weaved together the stories of three Wisconsin women struggling to break out of poverty amidst the congressional reforms of the 1990s. Moving effortlessly between the halls of Congress and the streets of Milwaukee, Jason captured the nuances of welfare policy without neglecting its impacts on actual Americans. Which brings us to today's discussion of his new book, A Good Provider is One Who Leads. This book has been receiving a lot of positive attention in the press. It's beautifully written. It covers the experience of the Villanueva, Villanueva? Villanueva family whose multi-generational search for economic opportunity took them from the Filipino slums to Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, and eventually that city of great opportunity and low-cost housing, Houston, Texas. Um, in the midst of increasing uncertainty about immigration, trade, social welfare policy in the world around us. Jason's work is important for reminding us that real people stand at the center of contemporary debates. It also sheds light on the economic and social impacts of the remittances provided by today's migrants who often only want to help their families. So I'm very glad we're having this discussion. I'm very glad it's being led by the great Stan Voiger of our economics department. And I'm gonna turn it over to them now to get it started. And thank you all for being here. Thanks. Uh, Robert Doerr was not taking out the trash. Robert was running the magazine, and I was writing a story about a family of Filipinos. We were young Washingtonians together with a bright future, and here it is these years later. Robert's gone on to a very distinguished career as an elected official, and the administrator of the nation's most important human services agency, the president of one of Washington's most distinguished think tanks, and I'm still writing a story about the same family of Filipinos. Um, <laughs> congratulations, Robert, on, the, uh, on your new job, which is great for AEI, great for Washington. Um, thanks, Dan and Michael, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here, and thank you all. Um, 30 years ago, I was a young reporter living in Manila with an interest in shanty towns, the scrapwood mazes that covered the city and much of the developing world. Uh, I called the city's most famous nun who lived and worked in a shanty town called Leverisa. Uh, I didn't say so, but I was hoping to move in. 
Sister Christine Tam was a friend of the new president, Cory Aquino, and busy on a commission drafting a new constitution. Call me back in a few months, she snapped. Hoping for a quicker audience, I told her I'd been working with another nun in her order, but apparently they weren't friends. That's a mistake, she said. Meet me tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, in front of the Manila Zoo. Are you CIA, she asked when I arrived. Well, you wouldn't tell me if you were. She let me know that living with a Leverisa family wouldn't work. The poor are magnificent people, unlike the rich, she said. But Americans need toilets, and Leverisa lack them. A family would feel a need to buy me expensive food. I'd be a burden. Sister Christine talked on, talking about uh, denouncing the American military bases, American corporations. Then she waved a hand above her head, and she said, that's all up here, meaning politics. Somehow we need to build closer links between the first and third worlds. If I returned in a few days, she'd see what she could do. I came back thinking she'd used the time between our visits to approach a family or two, but instead she led me into the alley and auctioned me off on the spot. I knew just enough Tagalog to know the first woman she asked was horrified, and so was the second. The third was simply struck mute. With her thin patience exhausted, Sister Christine stalked away. If you don't want him, pass him on to somebody else, she said, and don't cook him anything special. If he gets sick, too bad. I don't know who was more frightened, the woman, Tita Komodas, or me. We drew a crowd. Ask him if he eats rice, someone shouted. Ask him if he wants to marry a Filipina. Tita stalled for as long as she could. Then she gave in to what she took to be Sister Christine's request, and she offered me a spot on her floor. I was interested in slum life, not migration, but migration was how the family survived. Tita's husband, Emmett, was 5,000 miles away, cleaning pools in Saudi Arabia while Tita was home raising their five kids on the money he sent back. All five kids grew up to become overseas workers, too, and they're part of a large extended family spread out across the globe. Just about everything that could happen to a migrant family, good or bad, happened to one of them. The member of the family I came to know best was Tita's daughter, Rosalie. She used her father's remittances to make the long leap from the slums to nursing school and spent nearly two decades working in the Persian Gulf, mostly Abu Dhabi, all the while hoping to get to the States. She was just about to give up when a hurricane slammed into Galveston, Texas, with Katrina-like consequences. A sixth of the city never returned. Unable to lure enough nurses back to the struggling island, the local hospital finally recruited abroad. 24 nurses to open a new ward. Rosalie finally had her chance. She arrived in the summer of 2012. Her husband, Chris, and their three children soon followed. Their period of adjustment coincided with the rise of Donald Trump and a surge of conservative populism that regards assimilation as a failure and immigrants as a threat to jobs, culture, safety, fiscal health, and national security. The Villanueva story offers a retort with a house in the suburbs and kids on the honor roll, they achieved in three years a degree of assimilation that used to take three generations. And they did so, moreover, in Metro Houston, a hub of pro-immigrant sentiment deep in red state America. That's a hint, perhaps, that immigration is less divisive in daily life than it is in national politics. In a country of 44 million immigrants, no family stands for the whole. The Villanuevas merely stand for the large part missing from the presidential Twitter feed. Rosalie's experience also happens to be the most successful anti-poverty story I know. It began in the early 1950s when a young boy on a distant island was smuggled aboard a crowded ferry for an overnight trip to Manila. Rosalie's father, Emmett, was recently orphaned and a distant relative visiting the province had agreed to take him home. Home was Leverisa, a squalid mud flat ruled by warring gangs where sanitation consisted of flying saucers bundles of waste wrapped in newspapers and flung into the surrounding canals. Emmett liked the tumult of city life. He liked the garish jeepneys, the babble of dialects, the men throwing right dice in the alleys. He wore his geniality as a shield and was quick to make friends. Drawn to commerce more than to school, he spent his youth in traffic, hawking newspapers and cigarettes. In his early 20s, he landed his first real job, cleaning a government pool. He was walking home with his first paycheck when he spied a beautiful young woman in the alley, ironing clothes. But Tita had no interest. She considered him plain-looking and poorer than a rat, but Emmett's persistence carried the day. 
They married in 1967, and five children followed. Alliteratively, their names are Rolando, Rowena, Rosalie, Roldan, and Rosalier. Rowena, who is Rosalie's older sister, was born with a heart defect that left her perpetually weak and in need of medicine that Emmett couldn't afford. After years of fretting over her fail, frail health, Emmett dropped to his knees and asked God to make a decision. Take his daughter or let him have her. And God answered in a mysterious way. Soon after, Emmett got an offer to work in Saudi Arabia. He'd be away from his family for two years in an Islamic autocracy where stories of abused workers are rife, but he'd earned 10 times his manila pay for doing exactly the same work. He accepted on the spot. By the time I arrived, five, seven years later, Emmett was on his third contract, Rowena had her medicine, and their house was one of the few in Leverisa with a toilet. I had found my place among the poor. But I wasn't quite sure what to do with them, and they weren't quite sure what to do with me. Language gaps and excessive politeness kept Tita and me strangers for a few days. Then she enlisted my help with a gluing project, turning newspapers into paper bags. I botched the job so badly, she laughed and threatened to mark them made in USA. <laughs> Half her life revolved around drudgery. I'd be on my floor mat before dawn, listening to her boil the breakfast rice. I'd be back there again at midnight, listening to her wrestle the laundry. The other half revolved around slum solidarity. As a member of Sister Christine's uplift group, Tita was deeply involved in a program of Bible studies and livelihood projects meant to answer the question, what would Jesus do if Jesus were a squatter? As a manager of the co-op store, Tita was responsible for distributing 2,000 eggs a week, which she stacked under a fluorescent light in the kitchen to keep away the rats. Between chores, Tita told me she'd been asking God a question. Why, if you love your son, are so many Filipinos poor? It's the central question of faith. Why does God, being omnipotent, allow suffering, and one with special meaning in a place that suffers as much as Leverisa? I asked what God had answered. Not yet, she laughed, as if mocking her presumptuous attempt to fortify her faith. I'm not sure what I expected to find in the Manila slums, but it wasn't a woman in a worn house coat trying to live out the gospel beneath a tower of eggs. Rosalie was Tita's main helper, a shy, dutiful girl who always got cast as a nun in the school plays. If you were going to pick the girl who was with the drive to, pick Lev to escape Leverisa, you wouldn't have picked Rosalie. Others were stronger or more outgoing or more academically gifted. The bees she made in high school showed no special academic promise but the most telling line on Rosalie's transcript wasn't her grades. Through four years of poverty and literal revolution, she never missed a day. About high school is where I got grit, she said. The surest way for a Filipino woman to advance was to become a nurse. The US had established the country's first nursing schools during the colonial occupation. Filipinos trained in English on an American curriculum, and over the decades, thousands had migrated to the States. Nursing school was a leap for a girl from the slums, but one that Rosalie made. Then an uncle returned from Saudi Arabia and said a hospital near Mecca was hiring. On her second contract in Saudi, Rosalie met her husband, Chris, a Filipino man working in a Jeddah factory. They courted secretly to avoid the religious police and married in the Philippines. Family logistics got complicated. A daughter followed, then a job in Abu Dhabi, then another daughter, then a son. Though Rosalie and Chris worked in Abu Dhabi, the kids mostly lived in the Philippines with Tita and Emmett on the farm where they moved after leaving the slums. The parent-child separation was supposed to be a short-term arrangement until Rosalie got a job in the States, but it lasted eight years. Rosalie and I kept in touch, but we didn't see each other for two decades. Then I went back to write a story about the family for the New York Times Magazine. The light bulb moment for me in, in understanding the importance of global migration was learning that remittances, the sums that migrants send home, are more than three times the world's foreign aid budgets combined. Migration is the world's largest anti-poverty program. If you think poor people should do more to help themselves, migrants do. No country does more to promote migration than the Philippines, where the government trains and markets overseas workers and presidents celebrate them as heroes. Migration is to the Philippines what cars once were to Detroit, the civil religion. The paper sent me to explore migration's effect on P Philippine culture, <laughs> and I worried the story might be too subtle for an outsider to grasp. 
Then I rode past the Philippines Central Bank where the year's remittance tally was strung up in Christmas lights. The story wasn't subtle. A quarter billion migrants have spread out across the globe, and they support a population back home as big if not bigger. But what characterizes modern migration isn't just its size, but its ubiquity. Ireland has had its first African-born mayor. Mongolians do scut work in Prague. Every country's stories differ, but the underlying forces are generally the same. Rich aging countries need workers. Workers in poor countries need jobs. Cheap travel speeds the migrants' way, and instant communication spreads word that opportunity waits. Captured by the sweep of the migration story, I decided to expand the magazine article into a book built around Rosalie and her family. There was one problem. It was a story about Filipinos in Abu Dhabi, a subject whose relevance to American life was peripheral at best. Then a month after I committed to the project, the narrative gods smiled. Rosalie got a job in Texas. I met her in Manila and we traveled to Galveston, where things got off to a rocky start. She came expecting Disney World, but wound up in a declining blue collar town with a vista of vacant lots. The cost of living was higher than she expected. American English was hard to understand. When someone suggested we eat lunch at a little hole in the wall, Rosalie looked alarmed. Hole in the wall, she said. The hole in the wall served poor boys. Why not poor girls, she asked. World travelers aren't always worldly. Rosalie had worked abroad for nearly two decades, but always in a cocoon of Filipinos. Homesick, she retreated into the familiar. There are 7,641 islands in the Philippines, and Rosalie's apartment became the 7,642nd, with purple yam in the refrigerator and Tagalog soaps on TV. The first place Rosalie felt comfortable was in the hospital, not because the work was easy, but because she felt equal to its difficulties. Work became her vehicle for assimilation. One thing to notice about Rosalie's work is that she didn't take an American job. She filled a job that the hospital had been trying to fill for years, and in doing so, improved the community's health care. Another thing to note is that Rosalie is a really good nurse. The hospital gave me a pair of scrubs and permission to follow her around the ward. But the most telling testimonial emerged in a Walmart produce aisle. Rosalie was grocery shopping when a former patient rushed up and said, remember me? Rosalie's blank look made it clear that she did not. GI bleed, the woman said. Bad GI bleed. Rosalie brightened. Room 13. It had been six months. Though the woman had no idea who I was, she turned to me and gushed. You can just tell she really loves to take care of people, she said. It isn't like this is just my job. I heard that a lot. One patient recalled waking up from surgery and looking at Rosalie's face. I just remember thinking, she's got the kindest eyes, she said. Another said, it's just like she feels your pain. One night, a delusional man tried to climb out of bed, tangled up in wires and protective boots. It took five nurses to, to restrain him. One nurse complained he had hurt her hand. Another asked if I now understood how hard they had to work for their money. Somebody said, just leave him. He wasn't Rosalie's patient, but Rosalie broke the impasse. She called the resident, woke her up, and insisted she come take his, change his medication, which quieted the patient for the night. Given all the talk of immigrants taking jobs, I wondered if her patients harbored any resentments, and I made a point of asking in private. Not one did. They noticed her care, not her ethnicity. If anyone would resent her, I thought it might be an elderly African-American woman who told me she'd always wanted to be a nurse, um, but had never gotten beyond minimum wage work as a nursing aide. How did she feel about foreigners getting the job she wanted, I asked. Though she was black and Rosalie was Filipino, she said she considered themselves part of the same clan, the tribe of low-born strivers. I admire everybody and anybody that tries to get up just a little higher, she said. Don't stop. Keep going. Six months after Rosalie arrived, the family followed. Christine was nine, Laura was seven, Dominique was six. After years apart, they weren't just learning to live together in a new country, but they were learning to live together as a family, period. The kids assimilated rapidly, but in surprising and contrasting ways. Christine, the eldest, assimilated to the popularity-seeking ways of middle school girls, snapping selfies by the thousands and posting them on Instagram. She's Americanizing, her teacher affectionately groaned. Laura was Americanizing too, but with a special gift for combining her Filipino and American selves. I traced the arc of Laura's assimilation through a story about Rosa Parks. 
When Laura first arrived in second grade, her teacher called Parks a hero, but the idea of a hero in handcuffs made no sense to a little girl straight from the Philippines, where children are admonished to respect their elders and obey authority. She didn't listen to the policeman, Laura said, so she couldn't be a hero, and besides, heroes wear capes. A year later, Laura announced, apropos of nothing one night, I sort of agree with, Laura, with Rosa Parks. She paid her money just like everybody else, so it wasn't fair for her to sit in the back of the bus. But what Laura admired wasn't just Parks' principles, it was also her politeness. When the policeman arrested her, she didn't say any bad words. For an immigrant girl deftly blending cultures, Rosa Parks became the civil rights hero who didn't curse. The point about blending cultural strengths goes beyond Lara. Studying 3,400 kids in New York City, the sociologist Phil Kasnitz and his colleagues found that children, on immigrants on, found that children of immigrants on average outperformed the children of native-born peers, and they did so despite having parents with less money in education. How could that be? The group argued that the children of immigrants often enjoy a second-generation advantage. Two parts of this theory are familiar. One is that immigrants, self-selected for ambition, pass along their drive, and, and the other is that um, ethnic networks offer immigrants advantages that natives lack. But the Kaznitz group also cited a third factor, arguing that children of immigrants often benefit from living at a cultural crossroads. They can combine the best of both worlds, their parents and their peers. Laura was second generation advantage personified. Her Filipino traits included her manners, her faith, her close family bonds. From America, she got a reduced sense of class and gender constraints and a license to ask questions. Nothing in the Philippines had encouraged her to probe. On the contrary, Filipino children are taught to obey their elders, not interrogate them, and a classroom of 70 kids had little time for raised hands. But American teachers loved questions, and Laura obliged them. Do fish sleep, she asked. Is the Leaning Tower of Pisa going to fall? Do nurses have to be caring? Maybe I'll just be a doctor. Curious how she had grown curious, Laura formed her own assimilation theory. New to the country and afraid of having to repeat second grade, I told myself I should be interested right now. Being interested became a habit. Or put differently, life at the cultural crossroads had encouraged new ways of thinking, just as the Kaznitz team had said. One day I took Laura um, for an after school snack and she sprang a, a sly question. She said, do you know how to infer? I frowned as if I was trying to remember. I'm going to teach you, she said. She paused to dip her french fry in an Oreo McFlurry and increase the suspense. It's like when you say, oh, it's cold. It's really snowy outside. I didn't tell you what season it was, but you can infer it's winter. Laura marked the triumph by stabbing the air with a milky fry. You see, it works. After two years in the States, the foreign nurses finished their contracts and got hired as permanent staff. Pay raises and, and permanent st status ignited the real estate boom. Six of the Filipinos bought houses in the same subdivision, and three, including Rosalie, shared a cul-de-sac. After just three years in the United States, that badge of belonging, a house in the suburbs, was hers. A month later, Donald Trump launched his presidential campaign with an attack on immigrants whom he called criminals, terrorists, welfare cheats, a threat to jobs, wages, housing, schools, tax bills, and general living conditions. He offered the cheering crowds a parable about immigrant treachery he called the snake. It's the tale of a woman, a kind woman, who takes in a stranger and is repaid with a venomous bite. Rosalie wasn't a snake, she was a nurse. In standard cost-benefit terms, her move was a triple win, good for her, good for her patients, good for the family she supports in the Philippines. But cost-benefit analysis alone doesn't do her story justice. Rosalie's escape from Leverisa is a minor miracle. Migration was her vehicle of salvation. It respected her talent, rewarded her sweat, and enlarged her capacity for giving. It made her life deeper, fuller, and more filled with hope. That her quest ended in Texas is something for Americans to cheer. It's good for your country to be the place people go to make dreams come true. I asked Rosalie how the house compared with the hovel where we met, with the leaks, rat, heat, crowds, and stench. Oh my God, she told the kids, big difference. Mommy grew up in a shanty. Christine's response paid homage to Rosalie's success. What's a shanty, Mommy, she said. Thank you.
All right. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason, for those opening remarks. What we're going to do, we're going to have a short conversation um, with Jason and with Michael Clemens of the Center for Global Development. Uh, and then uh, we're going to do a Q&A conversation with the crowd, heckling, you know, that kind of stuff uh, after we're done with the, the opening conversation. So what I want to do first, uh, I really enjoyed this book. I think, uh, Michael, you did as well. Uh, could you talk a bit about your sort of your your general uh, impression of the book, how it ties into various public policy questions. Maybe one, one thing that usually doesn't get uh, a, a, ton of a, a ton of attention is that, or, you know, I mean, get some attention, but I think a, a common American perception of immigration is that it's relatively, you know, unidirectional, right? It's a, it used to be from Europe to the US, and then, you know, people stay in the US. Now it's from Latin America to the US and people stay in the US. That's obviously, you know, the, the real picture is much more complicated. People move temporarily. People move from south to south. Uh, can, you, can you talk a bit about the book and, and especially how it enlightens of that state of affairs? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for coming to, you, you did yourself a, a favor by listening to Jason today. I recommend another favor, which is reading the, the book. Um, Stan, you asked Which, for by the way, is for sale, I think, right outside. Uh, Not coincidentally. Uh, after the, uh, um, so uh, you asked for my, my overall impression. I, I've, I've never seen anything like this book. Uh, it, 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 uh, it follows uh, basically as a single migrant, Rosalie, and her extended family for 33 years, age 15 to 40, uh, 48. Uh, as she uh, migrates abroad for the first time, I think at age 25 to the Gulf, and then somewhere around age 40, making it to the U.S., and uh, you know, putting you uh, as a witness to Skype conversations between migrants and their children abroad, putting you in the room for uh, fights that, in my own family, I wouldn't want documented in a book. Just, a, just extraordinary uh, granularity and, and detail, and uh, you know, it, it just. Uh, People like me go around talking about facts and figures, and they just can't compete with just masterful journalism like this. I could talk about the fact that immigration to the US has been a primarily Asian phenomenon, much more than a Latino phenomenon for over a decade. But that stat just doesn't come to life the way following this family for 33 years does. I could talk about. I could talk about uh, 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 remittances that you, you pointed out uh, 3.7 times the total value of all foreign aid, and, and by the way, just completely unlike foreign aid in that they are uh, the, the returns to a massive investment in human capital, uh, not a redistribution of wealth, and they uh, by and large go directly to families, uh, totally unlike uh, uh, most foreign aid. Um, and yet, uh, watching uh, in in just a great detail what the, the family uh, does with that money um, is, uh, is just, uh, just uh, is, is unforgettable, uh, uh, unlike the stat I just reeled off, which, uh, which uh, is, is easy to forget, and, and, uh, and I, I wouldn't blame you. Um, but fundamentally, what I found transformative about the book was the point of view. It's the point of view of a migrant family over the long term and in great intimacy, and I've just never seen that uh, anywhere else. And that's transformative in many dimensions. Uh, I would highlight, as an economist, the, the economic one, which is that when you talk to most folks about the economics of immigration, they just conceive of the question as, well, here is a government-designed, government-directed increase in the labor supply, and what are the economic consequences of that act? Uh, when you follow, follow a family over a generation in this detail, uh, it's just impossible not to think of it in purely economic terms as something entirely different, and that is an investment in human capital in every sense. It is an upfront, large, risky cost that uh, permanently and uh, 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 on average and often greatly increases the productivity of labor, the returns to labor, difficult to finance in every way like other forms of human capital investment. Um, you mentioned that Rosalie's dad's, uh, uh, the value of Rosalie's dad's labor went up 1,000% <clears> just by cleaning pools in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Rosalie's own labor uh, goes up by about 1,200%, uh, first 500% uh, uh, to Abu Dhabi, and then, uh, then uh, uh, about 1,200% uh, in Galveston. And uh, that's 
the returns on a human capital investment, which is the very, very difficult and precarious act of moving. So what do these people do with it? And that's where this really gets interesting. They, they invest in more human capital, and that's exactly what you would do with the returns to the most, by far the highest return investment at your disposal. And when I say human capital, I'm talking about the very most basic terms. What's the most fundamental form of economic human capital? It's a living, healthy body that allows you to become a factor of production in any form. Uh, first, Emmett's, uh, uh, Rosalie's dad's I, I earnings. I love hearing this from an econ economist's point of view. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, this is just a little slice. This is my, my uh, 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 slice on the this book. This is great. Talking completely parochially here. Uh, and I recognize that. Uh, but uh, Rosalie's dad's, uh, that, that, that thousand-fold increase in, in earnings in Saudi Arabia probably saves the life of uh, Rosalie's uh, uh, sister, uh, Rowena, who was born premature and sickly in a literally stinking slum. Then uh, those earnings, as he mentioned, allow Rosalie to become a nurse and go abroad. Rosalie's earnings save her father from a, a cancer that developed in his nose by allowing him to get proper treatment. Uh, later on, Rosalie saves Rowena again from a, a three-inch ovarian cyst that uh, uh, comes close to taking her own life and getting her proper medical treatment. This is what these people are investing the money in to start with. Also, other forms of human capital, education. Why is Rosalie's niece in one of the best colleges in Manila? Why, does, why was Rosalie able to become a nurse in the first place? Because a big part of the, that 1,000% increase in earnings is being reinvested in human capital, and not just that, but also in the, the form of human capital that is location. That is, uh, uh, initial migrants help other migrants uh, to, to, uh, to finance this massive, uh, often risky and difficult, but uh, tremendously uh, profitable investment. And all of those things, uh, what they have in common is that they are, like, uh, like other investments, not uh, like other profitable investments, they are adding value to the world economy. They are net addition to the pie. They're not taking from somebody else and financing Rosalie's dad's medical care. They are expanding the value of world production and taking a sliver of that to invest in his, uh, in, in his human capital. And that's just, uh, that's one of those, uh, those uh, uh, transformative things that marks any great book. It, it, once you see it that way, you can't unsee it. And the, 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 the standard economic discussions of, of immigration start to look just uh, just stunningly uh, superficial. But let's talk about those standard uh, economic discussions of immigration for a little bit. Um, you've written in this area, and this is what, you know, much of the public discourse is about uh, exactly how you painted it, right? The government allows for the addition of some workers to the labor market. Um, what does that do with wages? Can you talk a little bit about that literature too? What, what finally, you know, just you know, we're doing an event at a public policy think tank. I want to make sure we cover uh, these various um, Areas. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit, how that literature has evolved from your own work uh, on the uh, Bracero program, maybe? Uh. Sure. So uh, let's call it the banana theory of, of immigration. That, that is, uh, you know, when there are more bananas on the market, more people selling bananas on the street, that's going to drive down the price, simple supply and demand. Uh, migrants, it turns out, are not uh, 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 like bananas in the labor market, uh, they, uh, they are also consumers, they are also factors of production, they play many uh, other economic roles other than a, a, a banana, and for that reason, uh, in economic terms, uh, their presence tends to shift demand curves, not just shift supply curves. Um, so uh, a, a stark illustration is a, a paper you, you mentioned on the, the elimination of the, the bracero workers from the, the U.S. Uh, farm economy. In, uh, at, the, at the end of 1964. My co-authors and I wrote a paper about it. Uh, the explicit goal of Kennedy and then Johnson were to raise uh, farm workers' wages, increase, increase employment prospects for US farm workers. And we just asked the question, well, did that happen? Uh, for example, in, in states from which more braceros were eliminated as a fraction of the farm workforce, do you see uh, 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 different trends in wages for U.S. farm workers, employment for U.S. farm workers, than states where almost none or none uh, 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 of, the, of the labor force was eliminated by expelling the braceros. And the, the bottom line is that nothing happened to wages and nothing happened to employment of, uh, of, uh, of U.S. workers. 
Now, if you subscribe to the banana theory of, of labor, that's, that's, a, that's a big surprise. It's, it's like, well, when there are fewer workers around, uh, shouldn't wages be driven up? That's, that's, that's just the most basic economics. Uh, when you don't subscribe to that theory, <coughs> and you think through all of the things that a farm could do when, when labor is more scarce, other than bid up the wage, uh, they can uh, produce less of crops which are intensive in labor and more of other crops. So they can change production techniques. They can, uh, they can uh, invent new production technologies, adopt new existing production technologies. They can move production to other geographic areas in the country. They can move production outside the country. They can exit the farming sector entirely and reinvest their capital elsewhere. Uh, we find that a, 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 an important uh, a channel in the Bracero case was the mechanization of agriculture, which is just one of those things I listed, but probably all of them happened, and they, they are all viable alternatives for a, for a firm, even in the shortest run. And that's not saying anything about the, the long-term effects of, uh, of, the, of, of, of Braceros or their families or their families' descendants on the U.S. economy, which are, which are even more complex. But it's, it's just a, a tremendously complex area. It's not at all like bananas. Uh, it, it, it doesn't just stand to reason that when there are more workers around, wages should be lower and vice versa. And uh, uh, it, you can already see in listening to this spiel why, why it doesn't uh, pervade the policy discussion. Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. Um, uh, this, we, this is the first time someone has called me a non-banana, so I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to hear that. Uh, I, I, let's let's uh, adopt a more negative tone and go briefly through the story of Jessalyn, someone you talk about who's not doing as well as some of the winners in this book. She appears in a couple of pages, but I know that you've uh, written a longer story about her, uh, I think, in, in 09. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about her a little bit, How to what extent she is a more of a, a worrisome story. What, what, why, did, why were you attracted to her? Sure. In the first so the Villanueva, Villanueva family might be considered a kind of best case example. They arrived with the parents uh, speaking English. They had college educations. Um, they, you know, Rosalie was recruited to a, a, a good job. So Jesslyn came um, from the other end of the spectrum of the migration story. Um, well. Not exactly. I guess. I guess if you're really doing uh, extremes, you would say somebody. The, the, the Villanuevas are more in the middle. Where, I mean, they're, they're certainly more advantaged families than them. But but Rose. But Jessalyn was a very just came from a very disadvantaged background. Her parents came um, escaping the Salvadoran Civil War. They came across the border illegally. They got legalized in '86 under the IRCA legalization. Um, and she grew up in Langley Park, uh, Maryland, which is as some of you may know, not far from here. Uh, in a Salvadoran gang area. Um, what I was um, initially reporting on her what was not the, a conservative Trump's view of um, the peril of having poor immigrants. It was um, the left, a uh, uh, sociologist named Alejandro Portes and uh, Ruben Rumbaut were concerned that there were, there were a, num a number of left-leaning um, sociologists, including those two, who were concerned that the Im immigrants coming into the low-skilled immigrants coming into the country would assimilate downward into a, a native underclass. They talked about a, a formal rainbow underclass. And I was kind of skeptical about the theory because I had this. This is a, a decade ago. I had the image of immigrants as upward striving, and so I kind of went into it skeptically. Um, but I have to say, uh, I thought there was something. Uh, to it, uh, having spent some time in, in Langley Park, where watching Jessalyn really self-consciously adopt the um, attitudes of kind of, of racial defeat that she imbibed from African American kids around her, and took in this, um, uh, uh, she, she she and her other Salvadoran kids, I talked about wanting to be um, like the black kids around them, tougher and kind of given the finger to the establishment. And they viewed kind of classically um, school achievement as you know, something that white kids did. Um, th this wasn't, it wasn't like they had, it was all very self-conscious. I was struck by how, how much they could articulate. We want to be like them. They're strong. Um, uh, so I, it made me worry that there could be, I think the sociologist's term um, uh, it was like an ethnic reaction that, um, in fact, there was some research done in the 90s around the time of Prop 187 in California that kids in there, there's some research that happened to be in the field when that was going on. 
they, in, they interviewed a bunch of Mexican American kids in high school. In your freshman year, they most called themselves Mexican American. By the senior year, they were more likely to call themselves Mexicans. And because it was taking place in a context of um, uh, lots of public a antipathy towards immigrants, and it formed a kind of hostile, racial, defiant you know, reaction. So I, I worry that kind of narrative could uh, impede assimilation, and we're, we're certainly in another period like that. Yeah, so th this relates a little bit to, uh, uh, I guess, a different social science strand where uh, where people are worried or concerned about large flows of immigrants from, from especially from non-developed uh, countries, where they they believe that the immigrants will uh, come and sort of infuse U.S. institutions with the sort of low quality of institutions in the countries of origin. Uh, and I know Michael, you have your views on that, and I was wondering if you could you could talk about that a little bit. To what extent there's evidence for for that kind of phenomenon? Uh, you know how you how you see that that debate. Yes, uh, Lance Pritchett and I wrote a, a paper on this in the Journal of Development Economics. State the, state the theory that before you refute it. So the uh, I'm I'm going to flip the, the the statement and make an equivalent statement, which is that the argument is that the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, economic and social institutions are, uh, are are preserved or even advanced by uh, selectively barring immigrants from uh, poor countries in that. Uh, 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 and uh, through what in the economics literature is literally called the epidemiological model, uh, migrants from poor countries transmit from those countries to destination countries uh, the, the causes of poverty uh, at the origin, uh, lack of social trust, uh, 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 unwillingness to follow the rules, uh, even uh, uh, violence, uh, this sort of thing. Culturally or just because they come in so because the infusion of a large number of poor children in a certain school can overwhelm it? Uh, both. You, you, you could imagine, uh, you know, just to take the example of, of, uh, of crime, mm -hmm. crime uh, in principle happening um, uh, in an immigrant community among immigrants. Uh, you could also, and this has been argued in the literature, uh, uh, claim that, um, that by, by disadvantaging by further disadvantaging already disadvantaged groups in the U.S., uh, immigrants cross crime among them. Uh, George Borjas and others have, have, uh, have argued that black incarceration has been caused to rise by the presence of immigrants from, from, uh, from developing countries. Uh, many different channels. Uh, uh, there, there's a big problem with the, uh, the overarching argument of the, of the epidemiological model, and it's that there's there's just no uh, evidence at all that, that, that pro uh, economic productivity at the national level has been, uh, has been uh, uh, reduced by admitting people from countries where economic productivity is low. Uh, so I'm, the, the, the most obvious examples are Australia and Canada, which have a, a, a drastically higher uh, a fraction of the, of the, of the, uh, of the workforce foreign-born than the United States, and much of it from very poor countries, uh, have uh, uh, no uh, uh, a difference from countries with, uh, with, uh, with fewer immigrants in terms of their level or trends in, in total factor productivity at the national level. So if there is a, if there is a level of immigration at which, uh, at which uh, 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 such a critical mass would be achieved that, that the, the, the low quality institutions well, from quote unquote s-hole countries are in fact transmitted to the destination through this epidemiological model. It's higher than any level that we've seen uh, in rich countries. Uh, in the Villanueva family, the epidemiology <laughs> seemed to go the other way. Uh, when one girl struggled in class, the teachers blamed it on Americanization, that the Americans were transmitting. The, and the other one, Laura, the one who was entranced with Rosa Parks, and, and uh, uh, she was the best behaved kid in the, the class, the one that the teacher was always saying, gee, I wish I had more of, more of her. She was in a particularly rowdy class um, uh, of second graders, and I was trying to blend in to the extent you can blend in as a, as a second grader class. Of, yeah. yeah, so I had my laptop, and I sat in the back, and every time the teacher turned around, this one guy would lean over and go, yo, fast typing dude. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura, had her little prim white sweater in her hand, you know, and a shiny apple on her. She, she was, uh, as her teacher put, called her, she was fresh off the boat Filipino, was how her teacher, teacher celebrated her. 
when she heard she was getting a, uh, a Filipino girl, she said, she told the principal, fresh off the boat, Filipino? Sounds derogatory, but she meant it as uh, in, a, in a, she was happy about it because she had grown up in Singapore for part of her life and her best friend was Filipino and she imagined she was gonna get this really well-behaved, polite little Filipino girl, which is exactly what she got out of central casting. And um, I think she, she kept Miss Job uh, uh, sane for the second half of the second grade. Oh, so uh, let's talk about the, the Philippines for a little bit. So in, in Europe, a lot of immigration has come from former colonies. And that's, it's very, you know, there's a lot of awareness that that's the tide that has driven a lot of the, the migration. In the, in the US Filipino context, that's not, I know that Americans don't like to talk about their former colonies as former colonies, but that's, well, they don't. Uh, but that's not, that's never really the context in which it's, in which it's seen. Did you, while reporting about writing the book, did you meet people who t thought about it that way, who talked about it that way? as you know, going to the metropolis? Is it the obvious destiny? Uh, I think it's an accurate destiny? way to think about it. Okay. I think you're also right that nobody does. Okay, um, okay. No, 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 at, no, at, no, at no one point, Tita, curious, but. At one point, Tita, the mother of the family, when I moved to Aspen, said, what, what do Americans think about Filipinos? I, I didn't know how to tell her. They, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Filipinos think about Americans constantly. I mean, I see. But so it does play that through, metropolis role a little You can walk through a slum a and yeah. you know, they'll talk to you about the Chicago Cubs and their brothers in LA and do you know him? And um, no, they know more about America than, than I do. So they're very dialed in, in on us. And they, you know, we, when, well, when I was living there, we still had the big bases there too. So um, the presence was heavily, heavily felt. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a huge mismatch. Perception. Yeah, yeah. But so people in the Philippines do but see But that's the how, US I mean, certainly that's how the nurse migration was, was seeded. Yeah. S, -S E D. Yeah. I mean, it was because the Rockefeller Foundation went there in 1907, I think, and set up the first nursing school. And um, the other main channel for Filipinos to come to the U.S. has been through the military, particularly as uh, naval stewards because of our naval bases there. I see. The, um, so you know, migration often, as, as you well know, migration often follows military engagement abroad. If you take the top 10 migration yeah. ethnic groups, in the, eight, eight of the 10 are from places where we've sent troops. So yeah, yeah no, for migration sure. tends uh, to follow military involvement. The, and so, and you, so you were in the Philippines in the 80s. Then how, so, but now it's 31 years. So did you stay in touch with the family throughout? How did that, how did that, did you keep your notes from, like, from when you were living in the Manila in the mid 80s? How does, I, how does I, that process I, work? <laughs> I did keep my notes, yeah. Because uh, uh, there's no Dropbox yet. So, there was no so Dropbox, it's very hard so to keep no track of materials. No, to, but, my, to my wife's um, uh, frustration, I keep a lot of notes. <laughs> okay. No, I did. I had, I, had, uh, I had a box full of notes and um, my old Tagalog um, vocab cards. And, um, we kept in touch before you know, there was Skype or email. You used to have to, there was one, there was a phone in livery, so, but what, he didn't have a phone. Her neighbor had a phone, so you used to be able to call. And the one bit of Tagalog I had managed to take away with me is, excuse me, it's Jason calling from the United States. Could you please get Auntie Tita? And yeah. you would say that, and somebody would say in, actually, they would say for a while. I think it, I think it you know, like in Tagalog it meant, could you please wait a while? You know, but they would, they would just mm -hmm. say, for a while, you call, and you'd hear roosters growing for 10 minutes, and somebody might be, you never knew if they were getting her or not getting her, or she might come, she might not, you know, $50 later, you're still on the phone. Interesting, but yeah, we interesting. Kept, oh, and Tita, Tita was a great letter writer. I mean, I guess it's the case for letters uh, over, email. I still have, you know, these long, my, my um, mother died last year, and I was cleaning out my mom's house, and there were letters from Tita to my mom when I was living there. Oh. That she wrote my parents letters just assuring them that I was okay. Well, She's just a sweet, sweet woman, yeah. Let's, um, let's open it up to people in the room who, who have questions, who may or may not have read the book. Uh, I think we got a number of spoilers, so spoilers are welcome. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, so let's start over there in the back. Please wait for the mic uh, and then introduce yourself. Uh, throw away your coffee cup. Um, I'm Amy McKinn. I'm a financial analyst. Um, I've come here a few times and I kind of get the, the pro-migration, pro-migrant, I myself would be considered pro-educated migrant. Do you think it's fair, especially from an economics perspective, to continually phrase, which I've heard here three or four times now, migration, like pro-migration, when we're sitting here drowning in student debt to obtain the education levels we are, um, I don't know that it's constantly fair to continue to compare 
um, natives versus non-natives when we're kind of taking on a lot of debt more so than other places. So. Michael, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I thank you. I, 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 um, it's hard for me to understand the connection between the student debt issue and, and, and immigration. I, 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 a connection I could imagine in principle is that uh, if educated migrants are, are reducing the wages of, uh, of, of, of educated natives and impairing their ability to pay off student loans, uh, that's certainly not the case. There's no evidence for that at all. Uh, in, in fact, it's, it's precisely the opposite, that, that educated migrants working together with educated natives uh, raise the productivity of each other and typically uh, uh, create each other's jobs, uh, particularly in the long run. Um, the, 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 the only uh, serious economic debates are about uh, whether, whether uh, workers with uh, less than high school education, which the last time I checked were, were something like 6% of the US workforce compete with natives with less than high school education. Uh, at, at every other level of education, there's little doubt in, in, the, in the profession about, uh, about the, about, uh, complementarities in productivity, uh, that means uh, not just uh, in economic terms, but also in fiscal terms, every additional immigrant on average, particularly skilled immigrants, is helping, helping Americans in debt pay, off, pay for their educations. I can confirm from personal experience that I really raise the productivity of everyone around me uh, <laughs> constantly. Let's go to uh, Robert. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, I, as in the introduction, I mentioned that you also have covered American welfare policy and public assistance. And I wondered what the family you wrote about's attitude toward various aspects of the American safety net was, and not only their attitude or, or in any use. Um, I th think of this book being related very much to American welfare policy, because one, one reason I kept thinking about the Villanueva family was writing about um, the American underclass, long-term poverty in, in the United States. When I was in Milwaukee, following, I spent seven years following a group of welfare families in Milwaukee, and uh, always thinking that, wondering why they felt there was so little opportunity for them, because having this, I always had the sense if you put the Villanuevas down here, if you put Rosalie, who had gotten out of this slum, you know, in Milwaukee, she'd find a way to thrive. So the Philippines had, you know, the, the question in American poverty policy when I first started doing the beat was, or at least the question I was, uh, one question I was particularly interested in was why, why don't people thrive in a society of opportunity? And the Philippine question was just the opposite. How did they manage to find opportunity in a society where it didn't exist? So I, I thought of them as kind of pursuing the flip sides of the, of the same question. So they were, they were always both in my mind, which um, isn't exactly what you asked, but they're, they're related to me. Um, did Rosalie get anything uh, from uh, in, in public benefits? No, I don't think so. She, by the time she became um, full-time at the hospital, she was making $80,000. So with her husband, they were above $100,000 a year. Um, no. Not, well, uh, you know what? Uh, well, yes. No, not a, it wasn't really an attitude towards public assistance, but at one point, her cousin, um, Tess, who's a nanny in Abu Dhabi, came, came over to see her, the two of them. So these are two, two girls, grew up, squatter, camped together, both went to Abu Dhabi, both sort of pulled themselves up, and they were astonished when they got to Texas at how much poverty there was. And they were asking each other as we sat in a cafe, what, is, what? Why don't they? Why? Why are people on the street? They'd seen somebody panhandling. Why are people on the streets? Why can't you know, America for us is a land of opportunity? They were sort of articulating kind of a, the same question that that I had been asking myself. And then I asked actually the woman in Milwaukee, by the way, at one point. I, I mean, I finally said to her, Angie, who's a, the main character of the the welfare book who I, I adored. Um, I finally at one point said, Angie, what is the what is it? What, what is it holding you back? People from all over the world come to America and they seem to thrive. What, you know, what's the? What, why haven't you found more opportunity? And she gave a, actually, a very passionate answer about um, her feelings of racial alienation. And she, she was, she was able to articulate an answer. Okay, let's go uh, over there in the uh, beige jacket and then. Over. Okay. Is it not beige? I'm, I'm 
beige to the soul. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly. My father was born in a non-English speaking household and when he was 16 he won a scholar full scholarship to Yale. He and Rosalie are examples of the American miracle. But the question, when Rosalie gets to Houston, she's already effectively educated, literate, middle skilled, and middle class in her outlook. I think that's fair. What would, how do you think she would have fared if somehow she had been transported years earlier directly from the Philippines, not with Abu Dhabi and these various places in between, but to Houston? In a sense, you, 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 her story seems to be, in a sense, someone who worked their way up the, the, uh, 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 some kind of ladder, okay, which is not necessarily the experience of people who come into the I United States. I think, well, you're, cer you're certainly accurate in her description, of, in your description of who she was when she arrived. Uh, how do I think she would have done had she come earlier? Um, if by that you mean, like, with her family, I mean, I guess I would think they could thrive and raise successful kids who all got out of the slum, all got out of a slum in Manila, they would have been able to do it. There would have been more opportunity for the family in the US than there was in, in Manila. So uh, I think there was something about Tita and Emmett, uh, the parents, and um, the drive they instilled in their kids and the support they gave them that would have allowed them to find opportunity here if they could find it, if, you know, if they could find it there. Michael, you want to talk about this in the aggregate, like different? Uh, <laughs> That's why we brought you here, you know? You got to know the labor market statistic. So the, the, the uh, uh, something that, uh, that, uh, 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 that I found interesting about the book, uh, which is just an incredibly rich journalistic perspective, sitting there as a social scientist, I'm always thinking of, exactly what the gentleman raises, which the, the, what economists call the counterfactual. What would the universe have been like if not for X? You know, the effect of, of Rosalie's migration is not just what happened after she came, but what would have happened in the world where she didn't come, or whether when she, if she came at a different age, or if she went to a different place, or if, uh, if, uh, if her father had never gone abroad, and uh, if her sister had, had, had perished. Um, and these are these are always in, in, incredibly difficult to, to work out. I, I I found myself wondering about the the counterfactual Rosalie, uh, not just the, the the counterfactual Rosalie who came uh, earlier, but the 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 Ros the, the, the girl uh, something like her in Leverisa who who never had the chance. And there are so many. I don't. You might have seen this old movie called Sliding Doors, where the entire ch uh, course of a person's life is is changed by by one uh, door closing too early in the in the subway. There, there are something like 10 moments like that in this book where she just barely passes a test or mm -hmm. uh, Jason himself just helps her just barely get a visa on time to, uh, to get on a plane uh, where, where it all could have fallen apart. And what, what, I, what I wished for uh, knowing, uh, and uh, you, you ask a very interesting question, was, was a different counterfactual, Rosalie, the one who never left La, La Verisa, uh, who, who never had this environment in which her just uh, uh, astonishing uh, drive to, to succeed and invest uh, could find she, she financing for She had a, like a best friend in high school who was much more, Rosalie always described her as stronger, like the one you would have thought would be the one to get out, a more assertive. Rosalie was very shy. And this girl was quite confident and was in the same, the nun, same youth group. But, you know, she was more of the alpha, the star. And for whatever reason, she didn't make it in, um, so when I, I've been with Rosalie back to visit her, and she's still living in Leverisa, you know, in a shanty, and Leverisa, and you know, Rosalie, it's, it's a, it was an awkward kind of visit because Rosalie's got the four-bedroom house in Houston now, and talking to her friend across time and now class. And, um, what what fascinates that about uh, for, what fascinates me about that is is not just the the loss, you know, for her her kids or or potentially the loss of life. Uh, but the but the loss uh, to, to others, to, to all of the patients served by, by Rosalie that you talk about, to all of the, the extended family members who, whose lives were literally saved by Rosalie's earnings, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to wrap our heads around that. It's unknowable, well, it's, it's vast. I, I, I like your, your image of the sliding doors. At one point, Rosalie um, 
Uh, you need to have an 80 average in nursing school to be able to, after your first two years, in order to be able to finish and go into your clinical. So that if anybody with below an 80 gets weeded out after the first two years. Rosalie's got a 79.5, and her name appears on this list outside the dean's office. They list everybody's name. You know, you're gone. And she's, so she leaves with this group of 10 girls all crying, and they go across town and start applying at some other nursing school. Uh, and the dean, without ever talking to Rosalie for whatever reason, um, rounded her up to salvation by upward rounding, and she finished nursing school. But the point of those hard cutoffs is for people to write social science papers. That's <laughs> as Michael said, she went through a number of those like experiences. Yeah. Let's go over here. Please, please wait for the mic. You may not know this, but there is some, people we're filming you from behind, and we want to be the people on the internet want to be able to listen to you. I'm sure they yeah. do. <laughs> uh, my name is Elaine Middleman. I'm an attorney in private practice, and just first, I want to say what you, the counterfactual you talked about could happen to two people from high school, and I'm from Indiana, you know. So I mean, it, I don't think it has to do with the Philippines necessarily about who turns out in a big house and who doesn't, but. Um, I'm not sure I understand the premise of your book. Some of the work I do as an attorney, and I'm appointed by the court under the Criminal Justice Act, and so some of the people that are criminals have come from Mexico illegally, and when they're sentenced, they're deported, and almost invariably they say that they came to the United States so they could send money back to their family. And presumably, to, I mean, whether they're actually doing that, I don't know, but that's what they usually say, and presumably to help the family get better, so it seems like in your premise, that would be something to be admired, but it's in their case, you know, it's illegal. So, well, se sending the money back is not illegal. Well, right? the fact yeah. that when they tell the judge, "I'm just doing this to send money back to my family," believe me, that doesn't get them anywhere with the judge. I'm, I, so, I, I mean, you're, are, I think your are, premise are you is: just, are they being are, are these people who are charged with a with a criminal violation, or yes, people who are charged illegal, like re yeah, illegal yeah. illegal reentry into the United States, for example? And they'll say, "I'm." Trying to support but, my family. But the criminal charges has to do be, with, with um, immigration. It as could, opposed to, they're not burglars or. It could be any, it could be that. They could have already been, I mean, there's any number of things. Some of them illegally ran over three, four, or five times, but it could be a drug dealer, it could be, uh, uh, you know, identification fraud. I mean, it could be anything. But I'm just saying their premise is that they're trying to make it better for their family. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, well, again, I don't know that that's totally correct, but that is almost invariably what they say, is that they're trying to improve their family's lot back in Mexico or wherever. Um, I'm not, I'm, uh, there are 44 million immigrants in the United States. I don't think any one can stand for them all. If you picked somebody um, like Jessalyn, the, the girl in the gang in Langley Park, that would be a skewed impression. If you picked a PhD economist at the World Bank, that would be a skewed. Um, uh, I don't present Rosalie as um, representative as much as I pr uh, depict her uh, as um, part of the conversation I think has been overshadowed by the uh, constant discussion of illegal immigration. I mean, certainly the crisis at the border is important merits the, the discussion it's getting, I think it has tended to overshadow the much larger phenomenon of legal uh, immigration, uh, of which I would think Rosalie's sort of broadly representative. She's, like Michael said, the majority, uh, the, uh, the large numbers now coming uh, for the past 10 years are Asian rather than Latin American. She's a woman, um, she's middle class, uh, she lives in a suburb, I mean, all these things I think are sort of characteristic. Uh, uh, I don't know if she's representative in a, in a statistical sense, but I think you know, there's an immigrant like Rosalie in every community in the country. And but she could well be modal in, in some sense. Right? And but, they haven't. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think they're, you know, if there was no illegal immigration in the United States and we had all this legal immigration, it'd be a big story to cover. I can imagine it's 1910 and um, Ellis Island, you know, these people are going to transform America and their children. And this is, Part of our economy, part of our culture, part of our politics going forward. Well, I think we're in a similar moment, and it's, our coverage of it is being um, obscured somewhat by the uh, constant attention to um, the border crisis. Michael, yeah. I just I thought that was a really interesting point you raised. Uh, uh, 
and I, I, I want to point out a, that who, who is uh, legally admitted and who is not legally admitted has changed massively over time. Uh, something that, uh, that I, I think not a lot of, uh, of people know is that uh, Filipinos were actually banned from naturalizing as US citizens from 1790 until those rules were dismantled between 1946 and 1952. They were actually banned from entering at all uh, tiny exceptions aside, from 1934 to 1965. And that, that's, so another counterfactual Rosalie is the, is the Rosalie who for most of US history was, was uh, under statute, uh, 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 by definition, uh, quote unquote, illegal uh, if she couldn't access uh, certain exceptions. That gets to a, a, a place where I, I, I thought the book missed an opportunity, and that was uh, you, you write. See, the knives come out. Very good question. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I wished for. You know, you, you, you talk several times in the book about the, the, the transformation of American society through migration after 1965. That, you know, Lyndon Johnson et al. claimed they weren't going to change the ethnic composition of the country, and in fact did, and it was really a sea change. And, and here, is a, here is a poster a child of how that was happening you know, a, 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 a different perspective on the same phenomenon uh, would, uh, would argue that, uh, uh, look, uh, it was the regulations before 1965 that transformed American society, and this is the return. Well, what's happened since 1965 is the return to what it would have been if we had not uh, defined a naturalization as something not accessible at all uh, to, uh, to, to Filipinos. Uh, from 1790 and, and, until uh, uh, 46 to 52, uh, if we had not even uh, uh, defined their U.S.-born children as citizens until 1895, uh, if we had not uh, set a, a, a quota of first 50 and then 100 per year until 1965, which is why I'd, I'd say that essentially immigration was banned, the, the entry was banned from Filipinos uh, 1934 to 1965. Only after that, suddenly these draconian uh, ethno-nationalist bans are lifted, and then uh, people uh, like Rosalie and, and her lovely children can arrive. Is, is, is that the, the, the transformation of American society by a pen stroke, or was it uh, generations of draconian ethno-nationalist laws that transformed society in their own way, and, and, and Johnson's pen uh, So which, which is government? Which that. is the activist government? That, um, uh, whether, whether Lyndon Johnson was being activist by allowing immigration or whether 1924 was activist by... Which one transformed which is the society yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is, Good point. depends on one's assumptions right. about what Good society what would or should have right. been. Well, normally we don't see that. Or what the, yeah. right? That's the, Let's go uh, over there in the back. Yes, sorry, and then over there. Hi, uh, Tim Noah from Politico. Um, I have, a, I guess, a political question for Jason and, and also for all three of you, which is more basic, uh, and that is why now we're seeing, um, uh, we're, you know, we're in an anti-immigration moment politically, um, even though uh, border crossings are way down compared to the 1990s. We did see a blip this year, but, but now the, those numbers are going down again. Um, uh, and we're seeing uh, a wave of sentiment that's not only opposed to illegal immigration, but also opposed to legal immigration. We've got a president who's trying to uh, throttle back uh, legal immigration as well. Um, so the question is, why is this happening now? No, so, Jason, you want to? By, by this, you mean why has why, is Why that, is conservative yeah. populism, as as represented by Trump, having its moment now? Well, specifically anti-immigration, anti-immigration feelings. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it doesn't represent the majority, but it's still it's it's uh, um, it, Trump is pursuing so, this because it's right. politically popular. Why is it politically popular? Well, it's politically now popular as opposed to twenty years ago when a lot more people were coming across the border. It's politically popular among a large and passionate minority. Right. Um, yeah. Why has it triumphed inside the Republican Party? Um, I think you could. There's a, there's a number of reasons you could put on the on the blackboard for consideration. I think 9/11 had something to do with altering the context for it. It made immigration into more of a security question. I think the decline of the Cold War had something to do with it because before that, 
Um, the Republican Party had a lot of support for anti-communist refugees. Reagan was a very pro-refugee, uh, seen as you know, bringing in, keeping America open was seen as part of the, the, the fight against the Cold War. I think changes in the economy have made immigrants less central to uh, manufacturing, to business. You know, they've gone to offshoring rather than importing labor. So while business remains pro-immigrant, it's not as essential to business as it once was. And it's um, more focused on, on high school immigration now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could, uh, the demography, the, the fact that they've, um, not only the numbers, the numbers are bigger than they were 20 years ago, but they're also more spread out, including all throughout the South, which is the GOP's base. And I think the internet too, that, um, you, you know, immigration is a, has a kind of populist, elitist split, and um, it's allowed people to vote who feels strongly anti-immigrant to go around the gatekeepers and topple the establishment. I would push back a little bit on the overall uh, popularity of anti-immigrant policy. So if it, it really is more of a sort of base of the part of the Republican Party, and then you know the two hundred thousand voters in the Midwest who get to set all of American public policy. Who care about this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, public, right? public so, opinion the, surveys weirdly show that support for immigration is like a yeah. like twenty-year highs or something. And we've, you know, and we've seen a very aggressive pushback against some of the administration's policies too. Um, I would add one one fact that I would add is that we obviously had a, you know, severe financial crisis and a very deep recession afterwards. Uh, because, so some of, the, I mean, I think your list is good, but obviously we've seen similar political dynamics in many European countries, and it's you know, and some of the factors you mentioned are much more U.S. specific. And so I think that definitely. Uh, pr plays a role too, and I think the historical experience certainly is that after these kinds of deep crises, you see an upsurge of, of, of certainly uh, right-wing populism. The, the, the poster child of that is, is Chinese exclusion, which emerged uh, uh, late in the, the, the longest economic depression in American history. I mean, the, the, why now many of these things in the context of very high inequality Labor economists like Larry Katz and Claudia Golden have studied this in depth and attribute almost none or none of rising inequality to immigration to the U.S., but that's just impossible for people on the street to perceive, understandably. And, and Tim, you, I mean, you, you, everybody in here understands this. That we've been through a really dramatic change in American society over the course of my lifetime. I mean, these are... And, and, and even in my adult lifetime, I mean, it, it's not surprising that there is um, an element of American society that feels uncomfortable with it. And I, I don't think it it's not all racism. It's not all antipathy. I mean, you know, it's a period of sweeping change. So it's uh, uh, the fact that somebody's been able to exploit it with uh, appeals to racism, I think, is tragic. But though, though obviously that's not a necessary ingredient, right? So the most virulently anti-immigrant country in Europe is Hungary, which has zero immigrants and literally everyone between the ages of 25 and 64 has tried to flee the country. You know, because that, it's, the, it's the country that needs immigrants the most and has the fewest of them, uh, where anti-immigrant sentiment is the strongest. So I don't think it's, rather a lot of it is more emotional response to, to outside factors, I think. But that, that I really think supporters them. of immigration need to remind yeah. themselves that um, you know, we've had very high immigration for sure. decades yeah, yeah. and the country is really... No, no, I agree. I, I'm just saying we're not can, disagreeing. Yeah, I'm but, just saying you can have the anti-immigrant sentiment without mm -hmm. that having occurred. The, is what I'm saying. I mean, you, could, you yeah. could, to, to, to use Michael's counterfactual, um, sometimes uh, I think the question is, really why haven't we had more of a backlash or why didn't we have it sooner? Maybe that's part of what you're, you're getting to. I mean, the, the 65 Act passed. It created all this unexpected immigration and then Congress went back in 80, 86, and 90 and passed more expansive acts. So you, it wasn't a case where you had Congress do something and then there was a backlash and it rolled back. It, was, it happened yeah. and then Congress ratified it again and again. It's much so I think your business expert for the backlash, but it was, if it was driven just by sheer numbers, right? And there was one in California, but um, then there, it, um, part of the and part of the reason that backlash in Prop, with Prop 187 didn't last is because so many Latinos registered, and California went blue. So, so the, the 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 book actually traces the wave to 1994 in California, where I was at the time, and uh, so he agrees with you. 
Okay, I think we're gonna do one more question if it's very quick. Is that good? Uh, let's go over here. The, uh, sorry. Hi. Um, I just had one quick question referring to just kind of a brief comment you made earlier about how sort of earlier on in this process when you were um, talking mostly to the Villanueva family and didn't have much other experience with some of the other immigrants or immigrant families that you would talk to, you had a more sort of typical pro-immigration perspective, which was that as a group, they're sort of upward striving people. And it seems like basically the implication is that the story's just much more complicated than that. So I was wondering, maybe either from your perspective or from maybe also the economic perspective, is there anything wide scale that you can actually say about legal immigrants in the United States as a group now? Or is it just too diverse a problem to really fit anyone into any box like that? So I would say it's very bimodal, and much more so than the, the so if, if you, the simplest thing to look at is education levels, right? And so there, the, the, the big bulk of the US population has some college, right? So it's in between a high school degree and, and, and a college degree. Uh, certainly, if you take some college and college together, that's a, a very large group. Um, there are very few people without a high school degree and very few, relatively few people with a graduate degree. If you look at, at, immigra at, at immigrants, the, those two outlier groups are much, much larger. And so, it's that, so that makes it harder to find a representative person because certainly on the, on, the, on the skill distribution, people are much closer to the extremes. I think that's a fair representation of the mm -hmm. situation. Um, all right, well, we're two minutes over time. I don't want to keep people here too long. So thank you all for coming. Jason, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.